So walking into a bike shop, it can be pretty confusing with such a vast array of products on the shelves. And what we're gonna to tackle today is lubricants, greases, and thread locks, and where and when to actually use them on your bike, as they are actually specific to each part and also seasonal too. So let's take a look. So firstly, what is grease? Well, it's largely oil-based, which makes sense because it is, after all, a lubricant. And then you add in some thickener. And what does that do? Well, it turns it into a semi-fluid kind of substance like this. So whilst it's not totally solid, it's obviously not a liquid. And then the viscosity of the grease, so really that's the thickness. That depends on how much thickener you're adding in. Logical, right? Now, there are lots of characteristics that actually make up grease despite the fact that on first look, it just looks like grease, doesn't it? And there's three main ones really to talk about. Uh, firstly, the level of water resistance. And uh, for us cyclists, pretty important, isn't it? Because we tend to ride our bike in the rain a lot here in the UK. I know some of you rarely see rain, uh, but at the end of the day, we all wash our bikes, or I at least hope we all do anyway. So the grease does need to have a level of water resistance to it. Uh, secondly is actually the dropping point. So that's the temperature in which a grease is no longer a grease and ends up dripping. So turning into an oil or a lubricant. And then finally are additives. So that'll be things put in to try and reduce or resist corrosion. And in some cases actually try and reduce friction too. But where are we actually going to use grease on a bike? Well, the way I like to think of it is things which don't actually get taken apart that often. So things like your bottom bracket threads, if you've got a threaded bottom bracket, uh, all of your bearings, so particularly cup and cone. I appreciate that with cartridge bearings, it's not really that practical to actually go in there and grease them, but you could still layer grease around them. Also a brake lever assembly. So actually those bolts that go through and clamp the brake levers onto the handlebars. Now I've taken off some handlebar tape on people's bikes in the past, and it's been absolutely disgusting there. The amount of salt that has come through sweaty hands through the bar tape, and it's almost corroded through bolts there. So actually, by greasing them, you're gonna do yourself a favor in the long run. And a final one is seat posts. Now, I'm gonna tackle them more later on because there are some special greases to use. Now what grease to actually choose? Because there is a few different options out there, but for a bike, go for something medium viscosity really because that will cover all your bearings and any jobs you need to use it for. So any bolts in frames, that kind of thing. Uh, so something like this, it's pretty good. It's not too thick and it's not too thin. If it's too thick, then bearings aren't gonna be able to turn well enough. And if it's too thin, then it's not gonna stay around for long. Uh, in the winter though, I actually use a special grease. So I actually go to a boat yard and buy some marine grease. Why do I do it? Well, in the winter, the bikes tend to get a bit more abuse from riding conditions, and in particular, salt off of the roads. So that marine grease tends to stay around a little bit longer. and does in fact last longer. Uh, important to remember though, use some gloves and also a workshop apron when using that marine grease because it's very sticky and very messy. And I've ruined a fair few jumpers, t-shirts, jeans, I even got some on the carpet once and got in a lot of trouble. So for your sake, make sure you don't ruin a carpet or clothes. Now special greases, let's take a look at those. First, uh, anti-seize or copper paste. At first, they actually do in fact look like a normal grease, but they are different and it's not just the color. Uh, they tend to be either silver or copper in color. And that's because added into the compound of that grease is actually ground up bits of either nickel or copper, which gives it that color. And why does it do that? Well, it's actually to stop those two components that are being assembled together sticking and being a total and utter nightmare to disassemble months later. If this ever happened to you, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So where are you actually gonna use it? Well, it's great for applying to the surface of two reactive metals. So think about titanium and aluminium. So in that case, uh, bottle cage bolts, perhaps stem bolts if you've got something fancy, aluminium bottom brackets, pedal threads, that kind of thing. So what's commonly known as fiber grip across cyclists, uh, it's not actually a grease as such. 
and it's not set out to do the same purpose of a grease. But what is it? Well, it's a paste which is slightly tacky to the touch, and in amongst that paste are actually, in most cases, tiny little granules of plastic that are ground up very, very fine, and that is in there to actually create friction. But why? Well, carbon is actually pretty slippery, and in doing so, people in the past tend to have a tendency to actually over-torque bolts and therefore damage those expensive carbon parts. So by using the fibre grip, it actually takes up those tolerances slightly, improves the grip, and in turn, you then don't have to over-tighten your parts and risk damaging them. Now, where are you actually gonna use it? Uh, this one, if you read any internet forums, is of somewhat of a divided opinion, but I've spoken to some carbon fiber experts and luckily they've agreed with me on this. So areas could be if you're putting a carbon fiber seat post into an alloy frame or a carbon frame, uh, carbon fiber steerer tubes, stems, bar stem interfaces as well. Also saddle rails is a very important one because they have a tendency to creak as well as people over tightening those carbon rails and finally, not very common, but a THM clavicular crank set because that uses a carbon fiber spindle as well as a carbon fiber crank. And you certainly don't want to over tighten that one. So thread lock, it does exactly what it says on the label. It locks your threads. But why do you want to do that? Well, firstly, there's a safety reason behind it. So think about perhaps your stem bolts and your disc rotor bolts. Some manufacturers actually specify that as standard from the factory, because ultimately you don't want those things coming loose. If they come loose, you are going to know about it and it's not necessarily gonna be that pretty. Also, derailleur pulley wheel bolts, that's a place where you can put some thread lock. You could also use it on some other bolts that have a tendency to come loose, but bear in mind that if those bolts are coming loose, actually think about why, because this isn't a miracle cure, it's not gonna solve it and investigate that loose bolt, really. Important to remember, though, is to actually don't mix your thread lock with a grease, because it won't work. Uh, and also, I personally, I never apply it on aluminium bolts, Reason being, aluminium bolt heads are actually quite soft quite often, depending on the grade of aluminium being used, and they can round off if over-tightened in the first place. Um, now, some manufacturers, they do actually specify it as standard, and I have seen some chainring bolts like it, and those chainring bolts weren't able to be released without rounding off the heads of those chainring bolts. So I would personally avoid it, but ultimately stick to what the manufacturer recommends. retaining compounds. Now we're seeing a lot of bikes these days with press fit bottom brackets, despite quite a few people out there not liking them. And the main reason being actually is for the creaks. But with a retaining compound, you apply that in between the bottom bracket shell, so the inner side of that, and the bottom bracket cups. And effectively, it takes up those tiny, small differences in tolerance between the two components, which, I'm led to believe causes those creaks in the first place. So by coating it in that and then fitting the bottom bracket in, not only does it help keep the cups in place, but it's also, hopefully for you, remove that annoying creak. Give it a go. So lubricants are an area where there's quite a big bit of confusion actually when people walk into a bike shop and see a whole wall full of different types. Uh, ultimately, you're gonna use them on your drivetrain, although you can use them sometimes on cables to actually put a few drips in to get a cable that's not working that well back up to speed, although it's just a temporary fix, to be perfectly honest. Uh, pedal springs, that kind of thing. But why actually do we need to use them? What's the purpose? Well, efficiency, so to reduce friction of the drivetrain, also to reduce wear, and then to reduce corrosion, so any types of rust. But what types are there? Firstly, wet lube, obviously designed for wet weather, and it's designed to stay on your chain and your drivetrain in wet weather and doesn't wash off, uh, which is important for squeak-free riding as well as not getting rusty mid-ride. 
That can happen, believe it or not, if you go out for long enough. Uh, the downside of it, to be perfectly honest, is that a lot of dirt, grime and dust does get attracted to it. So you need to keep a close eye on it because your drivetrain is going to wear at a faster rate than using a dry lube. Then we've got dry lube for dry conditions. Sounds logical, doesn't it? Although it's still actually a wet liquid when it comes out. But basically, if applied properly, it then dries to leave a film-like covering over your chain rollers, and it doesn't generally attract a lot of dirt or dust either. One thing though to bear in mind is that if you do get caught out in rain, then it doesn't hang around for very long and it washes off pretty easily indeed. Now there are also some specialist lubricants out there, such as UFO Drip from Ceramic Speed, which is applied in exactly the same way as the previously mentioned lubricants. However, it is actually really dry to the touch and actually it does come at a cost, but the claims are that there's a reduced drivetrain wear and also a reduced friction. So therefore making you go a little bit faster. And also there is the good old method of waxing a chain too, which I did a video on not that long ago. Right, so how to actually apply chain lubricant. Firstly, a little tip of mine. This is, this is just my own view, but you may well want to listen carefully. Uh, I never actually use anything from an aerosol can. Reason being, when you spray it, you don't have full control of that, so it could contaminate, so it could well go into your disc brakes, render them useless for a ride, go onto the rim sidewall, not having great braking if you're mixing lubricant with brake pads, are we? Uh, so I go for something with a nozzle like this that I can actually drip onto the roller of a chain. But how am I actually gonna do that? Firstly, I make sure you've got a really, really clean drivetrain. So nothing on there, you've just washed it nice and clean and dry and then find the joining pin or the split link of the chain and get it in about the middle of the bottom run of the chain. So that's beneath the chain stay. And then just apply a drop. So one single drop to each and every roller, but working backwards. And then once that original starting point comes back round, stop applying lubricant. Then give it probably three or four revolutions backwards with no lubricant coming out of the nozzle and then wipe away any excess and you're good to go. Right, I hope that's been of use to you. And I want to know as well, what grease and what lube do you use in the comments down below? And remember as well to give this a video a big thumbs up and share it with your mates too. And also check out the GCN shop. And for a great video on how to wax your chain, click just down here.